So for me, in essence, a super house is something that is beyond the everyday. You know, we're very used to certain conventional ways of living, but clever architects can interpret the site, the brief, the materials, and they can deliver it in a way that is quite, um, it takes people beyond, but in a beautiful way, and is very adaptive to their lifestyle. We did have a certain criteria around, around what we were looking for and connection to nature was actually really major um, and it does provide quite a thread throughout the book and the exhibition when you look at that, that connection. Um, so site was very important, this 360 delivery of form was very important, a great interior was important, um, but also that it had something to hook onto conceptually. So that might be an idea that was delivered through technology or through craft, um, and so it meant that it just had to have one central idea that took it beyond the everyday. Look, to me, there are many things that would make a house a super house, that would elevate it to that level. And, you know, it can be in, in terms of the location, the construction, the elevation, the dimensions, all of those things would make a house a super house. But for me, the really important element is the emotional one. I need to have that emotional attachment to a house as well. It can tick all the boxes in terms of its construction and size and everything, but it needs to have an emotional appeal to me as well. A super house to me is something that's actually able to stand on its own two feet and really have its own personality and, its, and, and demonstrate this kind of clear thinking and, it's, and it, that, that, that really responds to the brief, the client, the context, and, and, um, and create something that um, we haven't seen before. It's, it's, it's uniquely relevant for that project. To me, a super house is an architectural perfect storm. It's got everything going. It's got the right materials, it's got the right side, it's got the, the right feel. And I think most importantly for me, it challenges the conventions of how you think a house should be. And then once you get there, you go, oh no, Yep, I get this. I could live here. This is like the perfect space. It's the space where you go, oh, it's the house that gives you envy. I think the most important thing a super house should have is a place for all your old junk so that you can chuck it all in here and no one complains that it's in the living space. So this is what I love. Uh, the term super house I don't think has anything really to do with the design of a building. I think through design houses can be super as an outcome and we would never sit down, roll up our sleeves and say let's make this one a super house. I think a super house is a combination between a client, their brief um, and the architectural response to it. I mean, I, th I think what's great about the houses in this exhibition is they just take a different perspective on, on everyday living. And I think that's why people can identify with it. They can think, oh, I could live like that or I couldn't. You know, when I um, talked to Jan Bentham about, about his tiny house, I said, how did you deal, you know, with children and stuff and so forth? And, and, and th those are, you know, real issues, um, but they were prepared to live that way. And I think it's that creativity of approach and again, the openness um, to how things might be or could be that really helps um, push these concepts forward and allows you to have something that is personally super. A house I visited on Sydney's northern beaches almost 16 years ago was probably my first encounter with a super house. Um, it was an extraordinary place uh, designed by the architect Richard Laplastrier and set back just from the beach, hidden there amongst the palms, totally dictated by, by the weather and by the geography of the area. The house was just to me an absolute gem and I have never forgotten it. I can remember sitting there in that home as clearly today as if it was yesterday. Um, and it was just remarkable because it, it, to me, represented a whole new way of living. And it was, it was my entree into a whole new continent and a whole new hemisphere. And uh, for me, that was definitely a super house. My super house, it's the Sheets Goldstein house by John Lautner. 
And um, Lautner designed the house uh, from inside out and, and, and everything within it. So it was a complete package and kind of sounds a little bit um, like a major control freak moment um, where, you know, everything, the house itself, including all the furnishings and little accessories are designed for it, but it's an amazing achievement. You know, back in the 60s, they probably weren't concerned with um, with safety like we are now. I think I've seen some images of people walking around and, you know, being able to almost fall, you know, to their mercy down into the, you know, into the bush. But we have to navigate all of these um, rules and regulations nowadays and still come up with something extraordinary. It kind of sucks. Um, I think uh, Lautner was probably a rock star of architecture. There was a bit of, I don't care, I just want to make it cool. <laughs> so. What would be, in my view, um, a super house would be um, RMA's Bordeaux house. Um, and it is, um, you know, the brief, or actually the client for that house is a, is a paraplegic um, person and, and, and his family. And the unique nature of the brief necessitated um, the architect to totally rethink how the house is organised, horizontally and also vertically. And um, what OMA did was to um, design a very large four by four metre platform, which also acts as a room. Um, and that platform is really a lift at the same time at the, in, in the centre of the house. And, and it totally, um, by putting it in the centre of the house, it totally structures the house around that lift, around that platform. And in doing so, just reorganises and rethinks what a house, um, you know, rethinks a traditional house, purely because of the unique nature of the brief. Well, I think that there are so many incredible examples, um, you know, around the world. But the one, th the one that I feel connected to, you know, are superhouses for me. You know, are, are these traditional island homes built, you know, often by the occupant and owner. Um, you know, with very basic materials that have been collected, salvaged from the place itself, often where they, there is the traces of hand um, at every level of making, where they've, you know, cobbled the place together with, um, with friends and family. I think it's the fingerprints of, of a human endeavour, or of activity of there, and that those fingerprints or traces are important because they reveal authenticity. It, it doesn't remove the story, the human story and narrative. I think places need to have a human story and narrative and they need, and that's how we generate this kind of visceral response to things. It was very important to me that small spaces had, had a role to play in this exhibition as well because I think that's the, the way things are trending and, and the ingenuity required from architects to deliver something small and powerful is, is a great example of, of how the thinking is expressed. And so in, in the exhibition we have, we have several great examples that are very diverse. So one is um, in Ireland um, and it's the Golding Summer House which is tiny and was originally originally built really as a sort of party house, really as a, um, a dance floor cantilevered over a, a river. It, it did go into sort of a, a period of, of ruin and has recently been, been revamped to have a more domesticated feel in that it now has a, you know, a bedroom and a, a small kitchen and bathroom. But it remains this kind of wonderful Miesian pavilion suspended over over the river in, in a way that is very unusual in Ireland, particularly in that period. And then on the other hand, you have in a very dense urban environment, you have Dominic Al Alviro's small house, which was a you know, tremendous global success and an award-winning project. And that was taking a sort of almost unbuildable, tiny car park site and turn it, turning it into something through clever planning and into something that was light filled and, and quite beautiful. Yeah, I mean, we, um, we've been looking in, in Surrey Hills and we found this particular site. It was a seven by six metre site, but it was in a laneway. Uh, it wasn't on, the, on a primary street. Uh, and it was also adjacent a 12 storey office building and it was essentially an empty car park for two, two or three cars. But at the same time, seven by six metres, whilst the perception is that is actually small, for me, I saw that as a key opportunity and it did immediately upon visiting the site was actually this is quite substantial. If you took a six by six by six volume, it's quite a substantial volume and most living spaces in modern apartment buildings don't even get anywhere near six meters. My first reading was, 
Wow, this is amazing. This is huge. <laughs> this is a big space. I could really manage this quite neatly. And the fact that I was surrounded by tall buildings also gave me the confidence that actually the height won't become an issue. Once you get elevated over the second level, it has an amazing view back to, back to the CBD. That started to set where we may locate the living space. And then we had the living space and entertainment and sleeping, so that they just become zones. And so we thought, well, we don't want the sleeping zone to be elevated on the rooftop. We want it to be more of a sanctuary and, and more low down. It was really about getting that living and entertainment elevated as high as we could, because you move either up to the roof terrace or down to a living space. So the kitchen then became this sort of hub between the three living spaces. So actually low down, it's quite solid the house, it's their punched windows, it's quite protective. Um, it is this idea of a sanctuary, like you go into this concrete bunker and inside is this sanctuary of, of your home in the city. And then as you move out from the lower levels, it just opens up to being very light, very spacious. The ambient daylight was fantastic. We actually built the house in four days. Because of the small footprint, because of the repetition, we built off-site, we fabricated everything off-site, we assembled it all on-site, prefabricated. So it was, you know, lift one, two, three, four, and the entire house was built. Yeah, you have to close the road, and that's expensive, but you're only doing that four times. So we delivered a building for the cost of an apartment and delivered the finishes and all of the, the value adds that I wanted in, in the project. So. It works really hard, the small house. Like it, it, it works very hard on many levels and I think that's what makes it a super house. It's not so much that a super house is, is super in terms of big or impressive. It's about does it work for my life um, and can it adapt to my changing life? So I might uh, you know, have kids or kids might leave or I might feel like at, at certain times I'm, I'm working a lot from home or we're out of home a lot. So, you know, can it um, expand and contract with me as my, as my life continues? So that is something, that adaptable home and that home that really suits the kind of life I, I want to live, that's a super house. The trunk house is located uh, in a forest uh, in the uh, central highlands of Victoria. It's a stringy bark forest, so there's almost no ground cover. It's just, just the trees and a quite a you know, very omnipresent canopy as well. But I guess from the outset, um, ourselves as architects and the clients were keen to integrate the house into the context of the forest so that at certain points um, the structure of the house, um, there's almost a confusion or a blurring between the structure of the house and, and the, uh, the trunks in the forest. With the engineer Peter Filicetti, we came across um, the idea of using the tree trunks or bifurcations to um, act as supporting members um, for the house. I mean, it's a kind of project where we really needed the right engineer uh, and the right builder and the right um, craftsman come sculptor to put the bifurcations together. You don't want it to look too rustic you know, or too kitsch, um, so to get someone with the skill to be able to, uh, to work these bifurcations and join the, the tops and the, the columns, which have different diameters and cross sections, to join them so it looks like a um, fluid form it takes a lot of skill and time. The house is basically, you know, one giant truss, so it's very strong. Even though the uh, the members are, you know, they're only about that that diameter. They're quite thin, but but very strong. Uh, it's a very small house. It's, it's the size of an apartment basically because it's a weekender. But we don't don't see that as a limitation. In the interior and living areas, uh, it's, it's all timber, and that was a, um, a conscious effect. Um, the timber lining internally on the living room walls 
is stringy bark. So when the um, trees were removed to make way for the house construction, there was a milling machine that came on site, milled down those stringy bark trees that were removed. Those boards were seasoned over about eight months or so. We weren't exactly sure what kind of figuration would get or grain um, after they'd been milled, but we were really pleased because the grain has a, a lot of character. So uh, to apply the, the term super house to the, the trunk house, um, for me is about the idea that this house is about going into a forest and developing a concept, in this case using bifurcations, using forms in the ecology in a very primary sense to create the concept of the house. Well, yeah, the first time I looked at the site, it, it was um, it was like sort of going into God's country. It's just like this, I haven't really been to any other places like that before. So you sort of enter the valley and you really feel like you're in this incredibly secluded area. And you also feel like you're in a very, it's not only sort of awe-inspiring its beauty, but you've got, the, you, it's flanked by two large mountain ranges. So you really feel like you're very safe and secure in, on the site. There's a creek that runs through the site. And so one of the very important parts of the brief was that the house had to be sited near the creek. We oriented the house along the axis of, along the, axis of the mountains because it was formed such a strong line, it was very hard to ignore it. So that, that became the sort of axis for the whole design. And we had to incorporate two sort of stone cottages that were part of the sort of history of the site. And apparently there'd been bush rangers in the area that had hidden out. Quite a famous bush, bush ranger was there, so we kind of felt it was very important to maintain the cottages as, as part of the house. I'm sort of very fascinated with the idea of grafting, so the idea of grafting in, in Japanese gardens, where they, there's an existing sort of tree and they, they might sort of chop it or they'll alter it in some way or they might add another piece to it, and so the new piece becomes part of, almost part of the whole, so you wouldn't really know. So that, that approach was taken. So that the, the new part of the house sort of almost becomes part of the old part. So the, the two cottages are sort of framed by, by the new house, but they become like sort of these jewel-like sort of special kind of parts of the house. There's quite deep overhangs on the roofs. It's really protecting you from rain and sun as sort of shelter. The roof of the house is angled so that they perfectly frame the mountain range so you sort of see the whole top of the mountain range so you sort of, it's not cut off halfway. They're, they're sort of angled right up so that you sort of see the whole mountain range. And the, for the new materials we, we still wanted to use something that was almost part of the site as well. So even though it's a light material we used iron bark which is a reference to a lot, there's a lot of iron bark trees in the area. Rough sawn iron bark is used externally. Everything inside the house is very sort of smooth and jewel like. And we've used um, black butt ply in, along the bedroom wing. There's also a bit of rammed earth that we used in the house. So we've used sort of local earth and did lots of experimentation with um, different types of rammed earth walls. And the colour kind of is quite related to the colour of the earth there. We've also used um, brass mesh on all the outside sort of deck areas, which give you protection from the mosquitoes and the insects and flies and that sort of thing, but also enable you to look outside, sort of almost like you're in your own little world, but you can look out, but you don't really feel like you're, you're being observed yourself. The surroundings become the thing that you really look at rather than the inside of the house. It's almost like a sort of frame for looking looking at the outside so the house itself is is quite zen-like and quite has this sort of sense of calm it was just great working on a project where you're in such a fabulous place it's quite a privilege to be able to design something that is really sort of particular to that area and very special to that area and, and becomes part of the area so i think that's quite a great opportunity for for an architect So we know that humans and you know, um, 
you know, respond to places. Um, and I think superhouses are these places that we immediately feel a visceral response to. We don't necessarily always know why. We might think it's because of uh, concrete or the way that uh, a circulation space works or an incredibly crafted material. But there are other aspects that are less obvious but are you know, as critical um, in terms of building a sensibility and a feeling of um, comfort um, within a space. Um, I designed the Croft House, which is near Phillip Island in Victoria. It's on a pretty exposed part of the coastline that faces east, so the winds blow offshore there, which makes it a bit easy because you can just face the view and have the wind behind you. The way it came about was I was there for three days and I didn't mind being embarrassing myself by looking like an idiot walking around and looking confused. So I pretty much just did that. And I knew the I was there with the owners and we were staying there in the old uh, place that was there. And, uh, and I knew they were worried about me. <laughs> but on the third day of looking silly and wandering around thinking, uh, I realised that a very unique thing was happening there where the, where the trees were all bending towards the ocean, so the wind was coming from behind. And so a scheme really needed to put its jacket up to the collar up to the wind and protect itself in that way. Um, the idea of a courtyard house was a pretty good model because you could make a protected it a place. And so there was a few experiments of, um, can I do a courtyard house that uh, doesn't have redundant space in long corridors, doesn't have the double-headed blinkers, because the courtyard house is giving you this, you know, shuts off all of that. Can I taper it off and just make it disappear? Hollow out the ends, you know, maybe a bathroom would work well in the end. Sure enough, it did work well. Um, so, I understand that it seems that this is a complete thing that's been placed and then the owners have had to somehow find a way of living in this form. <laughs> but it didn't evolve that way. I mean, sure enough, as that shape evolved, there was long bananas, squashed up kind of sea cucumbers. There was, you know, until it was practical. So. It started as a um, uh, exercise in passive solar for sure, and the owners don't use any heating or any cooling, and um, that works by having a lot of um, thermal mass for thermal inertia and well uh, insulated. And I think the form probably does a little bit for wind chill. These forms probably do a lot to shoot the breeze over and not really take the heat out of the building, and that was. Uh, part of the looking at the croft houses, hundreds of year old croft houses on the north of Scotland, the, the ground hugging things. Um, so uh, this landscape's evolving in a certain way with erosion, the ge geology, fertility of the ground, the winds and rain. So what if this architecture was to look at these natural systems and try and work in with them and to have them generate the architecture? So. A superhouse to me um, steps away from convention and in a way it's almost endemic, it's evolved in a place. Those kind of qualities I think we all innately really enjoy because if we go travelling it's those, oh look at how these guys are living here, you know that kind of uniqueness and it's not to say the generic modernism isn't exciting too and doesn't have a role to play, but me personally, I'm interested in how it's twisted and, and evolved and um, part of the system of a place, culturally and physically. Look, I think contemporary design is, is very respectful now towards tradition and towards the past and nothing excites me more than, than when I see a project come across my desk of a beautiful old house that has been very sympathetically restored with a modern extension. Um, 
I like the journey that that can take you on th through the home. And I actually do like it very much when there are two distinct halves to the house, where the, the, old ha the old half, the traditional half, has its own distinct personality, and then you sort of cross the threshold into the contemporary. But it's done in a seamless way, and it's done in a respectful way that really respects the heritage of the original home. We, we started the design of the um, Skylight House in 2009. Um, it's a terrace house which is located in, in Balmain. And the inner city fabric in Sydney is, is pretty well intact. And um, I think it's important to maintain the, the, the front facade, especially when it forms part of a continuation of a row of terraces. I think that's very, very important. And not only to, not only to maintain the, the, the terrace house facade, but also the form uh, of, the, uh, of the, or the main body of the terrace house. Uh, I think you know, that that's very, very important. Because what we were interested in is a counterpoint um, between you know, the traditional form, the traditional um, facade, and, and how that counterpoints, or how that is juxtaposed against a, a, quite, a quite a contemporary interior. What we decided to do was to invert the terrace house. Traditionally, um, in a two-story terrace, you, know, you have the living rooms on the ground floor and the bedrooms on the top floor and we basically flipped that. We put the living rooms on the top floor, uh, mainly to take advantage of the views um, towards Parramatta River, um, towards the front of the house, and also to take advantage of the sculptural roof forms, you know, uh, and uh, sort of sculptural skylights. In most terrace houses, you don't see the sky um, because your boundaries are built up, you know, houses are built up along the boundaries, so it's quite a rare experience. So we wanted, we wanted to be able to see the sky. Um, that was very important. And our general approach you know, during the design process was to really look at the house in section rather than the plan. Because it's all about the light coming down from the top, it's all about the vertical circulation as the living rooms are on the top floor rather than the ground floor. So as you enter through the front door, you, you enter into a three-storey high space, you know, top lit by the skylights, and then you rise up the flight of stairs. And as you reach the top of the stairs where the living room is, you know, you're, you're adjacent to, uh, to a lovely tree in the middle of the courtyard. So, and that's very sort of different from a traditional terrace house experience. It's, you know, the skylight isn't just a simple device which allows light to come in. It's a volumetric device which uplifts and, and sculpts the space at the same time. And by placing a sheet of glass um, on the outside of the opening, you eliminate the frame. So the frame doesn't interrupt the view between the, um, the inside and the outside. So um, in our case, what we were able to do by limiting the frame, you get the, the, the white um, roof forms juxtaposed against the blue sky. So the experience is, 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 is quite surreal. Uh, you can only achieve that through the detailing by placing the pane of glass on the outside of the opening. You know, I'm most happy with the way the light um, enters the house. And, and secondly, I'm, I'm very happy with the way we, we engage with the urban fabric and we respected the, um, the traditional terrace house form and the, and the facade. But at the same time, uh, we've introduced contemporary spaces uh, within the house. So it's that sort of juxtaposition um, which we're most happy with also. I was recently lucky enough to go to Richard Rogers' house in Chelsea in London and talking about super houses, it was extraordinary absolutely extraordinary you know he's a great architect and his home represents everything that he's ever done and you walk up to it and it looks like a typical Georgian house and then you open the door and it splashes of color it's a behind it is this you know enormous triple space white room super open plan open plan but super livable and I, I think that respectful nod to the past that's what makes it brilliant because you don't know what to expect. He's a big name of international architecture, and he's a, but his own home that isn't cosy in any way, but yet it is cosy because somehow his talent is to make cavernous spaces full of glass and steel and white walls feel like you could happily live there and read a paper and feel on top of the world. Um, can I talk a little bit about concrete because I'm obsessed with it? Um, there, there is something about concrete in terms of its 
transgression as a natural material and as a man-made material, but its capacity to sculpt and form, its imperfection, um, it's one of those things that has a rich level of patina and there is something about that tactility of materials. I mean, concrete, but also worn, uh, you know, timber that uh, grays over time or mild steel that begins to rust. It tells an authentic story. It tells a story of, you know, of, uh, of, of, of things um, or activities evolving over time. It's not looking to, um, and it's transparent. It tells you the truth about what it is. Even precast panels in that are you know formed up in factories will all have their own level of you know of patina and history and narrative and story and aesthetic, much like the fingerprints of humans. I guess the provocation of this project for us was that the client had lived on this site for many years, I think 25 years. We felt there was an opportunity to uh, provoke the client into doing a house that was much more suited to the collection of art that they had, a substantial collection of art. We challenged them or provoked them into thinking about what we could do, what we could achieve if we started again on this site. And as a little bonus, the house next door came up for sale. And so we suggested that it might be a nice idea <laughs> to purchase that. And instead of going for the usual ridiculous idea of a tennis court that we actually bridge a house across two sides. So that was that was the start of this project for us. Yeah so I guess there were a couple of major conceptual driving forces and the site itself was one of them because it's actually almost on a, on a, on a cliff, it's a very steep site. We knew we had to have something that would step down the site but we wanted the building to really contribute to the surroundings and it's, it's in a context of a lot of very large very nice houses, but they're all very nice when you're inside the house and all they do to the street is create a blank wall. And we set out to really do something a lot more sculptural that could really contribute back to the street. We wanted to, I guess, create a sculpture that was livable. Very important for our clients that this was not an art gallery, it was a home. So in a sense, we wanted Polly and I wanted to create the sculpture in the landscape and then show the clients how we could make that a home. Uh, we looked at many different artists and, uh, that we loved. Noguchi was one of them. And I guess Noguchi for us had a uh, sculpture that was linked and connected and created voids and uh, for us just beauty. So. You know, looking at the Noguchi, and we started off with this original idea about, you know, when, when you try and step something down, it starts to create these holes and volumes, and, and that actually was more about not so much even what we were building, but the spaces we were creating. We started to shift things around to get things to functionally work and get the towers and things to work. And then finally, and it was really out of responding both to the brief, the sun, the privacy, all, all those sort of things that make an actual house, turn something from a sculpture to a house. Responding to all those elements is, is what ended up getting us a sort of final form that twisted for the sun and twisted for the headland view um, and, and functionally fitted all the different pieces in it. So yeah, it was an absolute process. And made the client happy. And made the client happy. Well, yeah. It's a, yeah. Very important. <laughs> When we put the notion to them that the house could actually also be a sculpture itself in the landscape and really contribute, that they were excited by that idea. And I don't know how many clients would be. So that's true, it's, true it's credit to them. It's fantastic that they, they took it on. They had the courage to do that. And I think people don't read this as, as a house necessarily. Um, they're looking beyond it and they're looking around it as a sculpture. But even when you come inside the house, um, and again, Polly talks about the obsession with view, when you come into this house, you don't see the view. And it was, we were very adamant that you wouldn't just have that typical open the door <gasps> view. So they actually, I blocked the view. And uh, the Tony, <laughs> Tony and Carol now call that, that wall Clinton's wall. Like, they think it's hysterical. That how could you do this? We've got this beautiful view. And you walk into this house and you put a wall in the way. But of course, the view is revealed everywhere else yeah, in the get, house. You get that little so, snippet yeah, of it, you so. know, just this tiny slice. That, that sends you on, but yeah, it's, it's not the big wow. The, the choice of concrete was fairly simple really because the, we needed a material that you would 
read as, as sculptural. So roof and wall and ceiling and, and so feet and all had to be the same material. Now of course concrete is perfect for that because you form it up in those shapes. There's a real strength and solidity to it and yet there's a delicacy around it as well. So the way the glass slides into the concrete, even the detailing of the balustrades, there's this great contrast between the robust nature of the material and the, the delicacy of certain elements and with, with the art because the art is spectacular and uh, the, uh, primarily cubist or cubism um, again is contrasted with this really robust building. So I think it is audacious to do a house like this in this location in Sydney and then um, we, were, we were given an award, a local council award for this house for contribution to the built environment. Now that is amazing because Moss is very conservative. Let's be honest, <laughs> when we, when our first meetings with the client regarding our design, we weren't um, particularly um, uh, positive about how this might be received at council. So we had to say to our client, look, baby steps here because we might fall over at the first hurdle. But the house was embraced by the planners from day one and we had no problem with approval and here it is, an audacious house for this part of the world for sure. Concrete's great because as I get older I realise maintenance is always an issue. So you build a concrete house and you choose not to paint it. All you got to do is hose it. And I see, I see so much beauty in concrete. Um, and why is that? Oh, it's those great brutalist buildings that I grew up with. So, you know, schools were brutalist. The cinema was brutalist. My university was brutalist. And so it, there's a real nostalgic feel pull for me for brutalism. And then if I see it in a domestic setting, I don't have a problem with it. But I don't, I'm, I'm a modernist, so I, I, there's, there's no way I'm not going to subscribe to the fact that you can live in a concrete box with glass windows and, you know, just some soft furnishing solves everything. The Flinders House was conceived um, to be part of a very ancient landscape and the Victorian coastline um, is typified by secondary and tertiary dune systems that give a undulation and a soft roll to the landscape and we wanted the house to be part of that, not to reflect it, but to be part of that landscape and in fact go further and appear as if it was built millions of years ago, covered over and then eroded away and exposed like it had been part of a skeletal remain of an ancient marine creature. The brief for this house was quite an open um, idea. There were some pragmatic things about the number of, of bedrooms, etc. but they use it as a beach house, but it's more than a beach house for them. The house is more of a vehicle for them to use as a family, but also to use with extended family and friends. So it's more of a sanctuary or a haven for them to come down and have the opportunity to be alone or with a large group of people. The, the design of the house is based on, to a degree, a sense of mystery. So on arrival, there's a blank wall and a door in it, which is a bit like a small proscenium arch in a theatre. And when you draw the curtains or open the door, it exposes you to a magnificent view. So there is kind of an excitement attached to that, a quiet excitement. On the Victorian coastline, where the view is, is usually where the weather comes from. So we've provided uh, north-facing courtyards that are protected from the southerly weather, where the swimming pool is, for example. So there are all different places that you can go to around the house, depending on the climate. Um, and also that facilitates a sense of zoning throughout the house, so everyone's got privacy. So 
It's effectively like two boomerang shapes with a, a little zipper of glass between it that gives people aspect and view without others being able to look, look at them. Through the design of a house like this, you simply can't see from one end to the other. There's mystery um, that activates your engagement with the house. So the visceral quality of the body in the building is part of that mystery so that you can't necessarily know what the plan of the building's like. You actually have to be active in seeking that out and moving through the building. Because of the curves within the building and the timber beading, we can disguise drawers. So you just see the shape of the wall and a series of handles, but you don't see a wall with a frame with a door in it. So the sculpted form is highlighted by the use of materials. I think there are dramatic moments in this house and things like the stair to the um, upstairs bedroom um, could be, you know, there could be a bit of gone with the wind in that. Uh, the bathrooms are quite brightly coloured. They were meant to be jewel-like. There was meant to be a touch of Hollywood maybe um, on the Victorian coastline. I mean, I, I walk into the bathrooms and I always smile when I see them because there's something, there is something kind of luscious about them, but the materiality is quite simple. The scale of the building is based on a range of um, activities and sometimes our client might, just the two of them might come down and so there's intimate cave-like areas where they can retreat to um, and f feel like they're in an intimate space. Um, and also their children have their own private area um, so they can retire to that and they can have their friends down and go crazy in another part of the house while other things are happening elsewhere. And then there's more space if other families are down here. So. It's designed so that if you're here alone, you don't feel like you're rattling around the house. There are spaces to go that you always feel comfortable in. The materiality of the building um, does make some reference to bleach, driftwood or, or old whale bones. Um, but also it's in a monochromatic palette, which is what our work is about every time of day it looks slightly different. I think the house still looks quite fresh and there's a timelessness about it which is embedded in our work. We, 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 we're not architects that respond to style or decoration on a building. The building is what it is, it's a sculptural form and they're designed to look better as they get older. I mean, if we had to drill down a superhouse to, to three things, my one of my most important would still be the, the connection to sight and connection to nature, because that just brings something, the other quality. That's not always possible if you're in an urban environment. And then I would say it was the, the management of, of light, because in a way that can still draw in the experience of nature, even in, in somewhere that, that is more urban. And the third one I think is is that kind of indefinable quality of poetry or something that actually when you go into a space gives you an uplifting feeling because that was another aspect that was very important. These places should have a quality that is awe-inspiring um, and, and just to capture something that makes you feel different. Um, and I think if, you, if architects succeed in doing that, they've really, really done their job. And the you know, that concrete house, you know, this Massetti house. I mean, that's you know, you go. Yeah, give me that now. I don't care whether the children hurt themselves. I just think it's just extraordinary. Give me concrete every day. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful.